There's a scene in Vajra's remarkable debut novel, The Saint of Bright Doors, that has stuck with me vividly. Authorities impose a quarantine on a residential building, sending in forces to search every home. After pulling a few residents out, the lockdown is eventually lifted. Those who remain talk about how much they suffered during that time behind closed doors. But there's one striking detail no one mentions the people who were taken away. It's as if they never existed. This punching scene of casual erasure, a people just disappearing without a trace, immediately reminded me of the horrifying real-life accounts I've heard from around the world. In Russia, critics of the regime have a tendency to vanish into prisons, never to be seen again. In China, the government has disappeared entire ethnic minorities like the Uyghurs into re-education camps. And we've all seen the haunting footage of gunny bags appearing in forests near villages in Pakistan and Kashmir containing unidentified bodies. While the Saint of Bright Doors is set in a fantastical version of Sri Lanka, where versions of Buddha and his son Rahula still walk the earth, Vajra seamlessly weaves in these visceral moments that feel all too resonant with the harsh realities of our current world. That scene of people just blinking out of existence establishes an undercurrent of dread that persists throughout the novel's darkly humorous and imaginative journey. So from the very start, even as you become immersed in this rich, magical setting, you can't ever fully escape the feeling that something is deeply, unsettlingly wrong underneath it all. The comfortable fantasy trappings are just ornate packaging for an unflinching look at how the powerful can make the inconvenient simply disappear without a trace. Overview of the book. The Saint of Bright Doors follows Fetter, a young man living in the city of Luria, part of a vividly imagined fantasy world inspired by Vajra's native Sri Lanka. From the outset, we learned that Fetter was born under extraordinary circumstances. His mother, a powerful witch known as Mother of Glory, quite literally tore his shadow from his body at birth, marking him as special. Fetter was raised to be a weapon against his own father, a messianic cult leader called the perfect and kind who wields tremendous magical abilities to reshape reality itself. But as a young adult, Fetter has rejected this violent path laid out for him, preferring instead to simply blend into Luriat's teeming streets and live an ordinary life helping other new immigrants. What makes this setup so compelling is how Vajra deftly blends the mythological and contemporary. One moment you're being introduced to mystical concepts like people being trained as chosen ones to fulfill grand destinies. The next, Fetter is checking his email, going on another date, or describing the city's Kafka-esque bureaucracy in startlingly mundane terms. This seamless melding of the fantastic and the everyday creates a unique sense of grounded wonder. The magical elements don't feel disconnected from reality, but rather like they naturally coexist with the most prosaic parts of modern urban living. It makes the setting of Laureate vibrant and alive in a way that few fantasy worlds achieve. Deconstructing Fantasy Tropes The Saint of Bright Doors takes familiar fantasy tropes and turns them delightfully on their head. Right from the premise, Vajra upends the classic Chosen One narrative, taking it to its logical extreme. Instead of following a singular hero's journey, we're introduced to an entire support group made up of former would-be chosen ones people who were raised from birth to fulfill grand destinies of stopping apocalypses or slaying dark lords, only to eventually be discarded when it became clear they weren't actually the real chosen ones. One wonders what such a support group would look like in the Wheel of Time universe. Someone write that fan fiction now. Most authors, even Palahniuk, would be happy with just this transgression, not Vajra. Our protagonist Fetter is himself the son of a cult-leading messianic figure, trained by his mother to ultimately kill his own father. Yet he actively resists embracing this world-shaking role laid out for him, adamantly pursuing a life of blissful anonymity instead. By denying us a conventional hero's journey or any real acknowledgement of Fetter's supposed grand destiny, the novel constantly undermines our expectations as readers steeped in the tropes of the genre. We're made to question the very notion of singularly powerful savior figures and the simplistic moral binaries they're meant to operate in. Rather than revel in archetypal good versus evil conflicts, the saint of bright doors immerses us in the muddy complexities and contradictions of how power actually manifests and is perpetuated in the real world. There are endless warlords and demagogues all vying for control of the world and the narrative that governs it, each with their own Orwellian doublespeak about maintaining order through violence and oppression. 
In this novel, the idea of any one person being a purifying, redemptive force is little more than an intoxicating myth one crafted and deployed by those very same ruling powers to keep the populace obedient. Fetter's rejection of being that figurehead mirrors the book's deeper systematic dismantling of the often neocolonialist subtext baked into traditional fantasy's core appeal. By exploding these tired genre conventions, Vajra makes room to interrogate the complex dynamics of resistance, identity, and structural imbalances of power that so many fantasy epics prefer to ignore or reduce to simple archetypes. It's a brilliant, much-needed deconstruction. Rich and immersive world building. While The Saint of Bright Doors radically subverts many classic fantasy conventions, it still manages to deliver one of the richest and most immersive secondary world settings in recent memory. The vibrant city of Lauriette is rendered in incredible detail by Vajra's vivid prose. From the very first pages, you can almost feel the heat and chaos of Lauriette's crowded streets. The sight, sounds, and even smells are vividly evoked, whether it's the tuk-tuks honking in traffic, the aroma of street food wafting from roadside cadets, or the faint traces of smoke from nightly pogroms lingering in the air. Vajra seems to relish immersing the reader in the contradictions and dissonance that define this fantasy metropolis. One moment you're strolling past worshippers praying beneath sacred bodhi trees. The next you're confronted by visuals straight out of our modern world plastic patio furniture. Email notifications pinging on smartphones. It's a setting that seamlessly blends the ancient and contemporary, the spiritual and institutional, the wondrous and banal. This dense intermingling gives Laureate an incredible sense of history and lived in authenticity rarely found in speculative fiction cities. The artistic and architectural details feel deeply grounded in Sri Lankan culture, from the ubiquitous presence of Buddhist and Hindu iconography to the intricate urban planning clearly inspired by real cities like Colombo. You get small evocative touches like the camises and drapes worn by characters, or finer mythological flourishes like the giant devilish beasts that only Fetter can perceive. Yet Laureate's multitudes extend far beyond just the visuals. Through Vaja's crystalline world-building, we're also immersed in the city's Byzantine political and religious factions, all vying for dominance through a complex interplay of democracy, autogolp, and outright violence. There are cults and schismatic splinter groups drawing from both Buddhism and Hinduism, all led by megalomaniacal overlords with grand visions, whether it's Fetter's own father preaching a doctrine of subsuming all individuality into a single monolithic path, or rival prophets attempting to out-exodus each other. Laureate is also stratified by rigid caste and social hierarchies that underpin every facet of civic life. The authorities use complex formulas and Kafkaesque race science handed down by long-gone rulers to sort every citizen into minutely delineated groups, each with vastly divergent rights, privileges, and potential for upward mobility or persecution. It's an ingeniously realized setting that grounds its singularly imaginative fantastical elements in all too plausible real-world dynamics of oppression, subjugation, and identity politics weaponized into utter chaos and violence. Chandraskara alludes to the complicated legacies of British colonialism, Buddhist nationalism, and Sri Lanka's civil war when crafting this disturbingly recognizable future escape. But he never creates a one-one allegory allowing the world to stand on its own even. What emerges is one of the most multifaceted, thematically rich fictional universes you're likely to encounter anytime soon. The depth and density of world on display in The Saint of Bright Doors is a masterclass in how to transport readers to a dreamlike place that still manages to cut right to the heart of our all-too-real world's most pressing existential crises. Narrative Structure and Perspectives One of the most ingenious aspects of The Saint of Bright Doors is its unconventional narrative structure that constantly shifts perspectives and modes. Just when you think you have a handle on Fetter's personal journey as the central protagonist, Vajra will pivot to someone else's viewpoint or abruptly transition into a different storytelling style altogether. We get detours into folk tales and religious myths that provide symbolic context for the events unfolding. There are extended excerpts from play scripts and manifestos that mirror the book's exploration of resistance and revolution. At one point, the narration even briefly slips into a second-person, you mode when depicting Fetter's nightmarish experiences in a prison camp. This fragmented, multivocal approach serves multiple purposes. 
On one level, it echoes the very nature of Luriat itself as a stratified society comprised of so many disparate factions all vying for control of the meta-narrative. Just as there is no singular truth in this world, there is no single coherent storytelling lens through which to view it. The kaleidoscopic shifts also mimic how the experience of existing under an oppressive system tends to compartmentalize one's sense of identity and selfhood. Fetter himself is always code switching between different persony, whether it's playing the role of a cast passing student, a scrappy immigrant hustler, or a former chosen one weighing a return to violence. By refusing to grab primacy to any one narrative voice, the saint of bright doors leans into the ambiguities and contradictions inherent to life in a place like Luriat. The simple intimacy of Fetter's personal struggles gets constantly ruptured by intrusions of political upheaval, bureaucratic labyrinths, and social turbulence on a civilizational scale. In this way, the book's unconventional structure becomes a formal representation of how individual interiority is always being encroached upon and eroded by larger, more monolithic machinations of power, destiny, and systemic forces outside of any one person's control. It's a brave stylistic choice that keeps the reader constantly off balance and securely centered in the maelstrom that is daily life in Luriette. Language and Prose while the Saint of Bright Doors is bursting with imaginative ideas in an endlessly fascinating world. What truly elevates the novel is Vajra Vajra's exquisite command of language and razor-sharp prose. From the opening pages, you're immersed in a vividly rendered cityscape through sensory details that linger long after reading. With just a few vividly evocative phrases, Vajra conjures a visceral sense of Luryat's haunted origins and layered histories, He's equally adept at conveying abstract ideas and heady philosophical conceits through crisp, grounded imagery. Beyond the gorgeous prose itself, the author has a flair for playfully blending vocabulary from different linguistic registers. You'll encounter evocative mythological words like anti-god and grammary flowing seamlessly alongside modern technical jargon about things like racial typing algorithms and ideological apparatuses. This merging of the ancient and contemporary allows Vajra to constantly remind the reader of Laureate's palimpsest like nature as a place where past traumas coexist with present-day conflicts, where traditional belief systems get overwritten by mechanisms of colonial subjugation and bureaucratic control. Themes, violence, resistance, drama. While the immersive world building and rich language are huge draws, what makes the Saint of Bright Doors truly resonate are the weighty themes it grapples with surrounding violence, resistance, identity, and intergenerational trauma. From the very first chapter, we're confronted with Fetter's mother instilling in him the idea that the only way to change the world is through intentional, directed violence. This ethos of revolutionary violence as a necessity haunts Fetter throughout the novel, even as he initially rejects it for a life of mundane routine and laureate. But as he gets drawn deeper into the city's Byzantine factions and teetering power structures, Fetter is constantly forced to reevaluate his moral stances. With each new pogrom, disappearance of civilians, or act of state sanctioned brutality he witnesses, the notion of violence as a means for genuine societal change becomes harder to dismiss outright. Vaja doesn't present this as a simple binary. The novel expressly rejects giving easy answers or validating any one ideological position. Instead, we see how the cycles of oppression, colonialism, and dehumanization have become so ingrained and systemic that it's impossible to separate any act of violence from the millennia-spanning continuum it emerges from. We live in the wreckage of what violence has wrought. Raised to believe that violence is really the only thing strong enough to unmake and remake the world. This inescapable legacy of cultural trauma forms the backbone of the novel. We learn how Laureate itself was shaped by successive colonial occupations that systematically erase native histories and enforce social hierarchies designed to divide and subjugate the populace. In this climate, even spirituality and religion have become corrupted tools for oppression, with messiah-like figures like Fetter's father positioning themselves as harbingers of a totalizing new social order that would eradicate all diversity and individuality. Against this backdrop, Fetter's personal journey becomes a meditation on how one negotiates their own identity and role when all paths forward are predicated on perpetuating or rebelling against cascading injustices spanning generations. 
His mother's militant stance represents a righteous flame of resistance that must constantly be stoked lest it be extinguished completely. But as the novel shows, that flame can also easily become all-consuming, reducing the individual to just another cog in never-ending cycles of vengeance and mutually assured destruction. With its nuanced approach, the Saint of Bright Doors argues for the necessity of breaking these cyclical patterns of finding an existence outside the binary of complete accommodation or total devastation of existing power structures. Yet it stops short of providing a clean, simplistic resolution leaving Fetter and the reader to sit with the discomforting truth that when identities, cultures, and even realities themselves have been irrevocably shaped by the languor of generational trauma, any decisive way forward will inevitably be imperfect and incomplete. The best we can strive for are imperfect acts of reclamation in the face of irretrievable loss. Relevance and Takeaways the Saint of Bright Doors is a stunningly ambitious and accomplished debut novel that manages to feel both intimately personal and universally resonant. At its core, it's an unflinching examination of how cycles of oppression, systemic violence, and erasure of identity have shaped our world over generations. Yet Vadra's genius lies in transporting these heavy themes into a vividly imagined fantasy realm that enhances their resonance rather than providing escapism. By grounding the mythical and keen observations of our present-day political climate, he's created a work that speaks poignantly to our current era of rising authoritarianism, social unrest, and bitter culture wars. From the rigid caste hierarchies and state propaganda machinery of Luriat, to its factionalism stoked by religious extremism, to the scapegoating of ethnic minorities as a unifying force we see distorted mirrors of our own world's most pressing conflicts. The novel reminds us that beneath the rationalizations and lofty rhetoric, violence toward the other is almost always an exercise in consolidating power. At the same time, Fetter's arc stands as a affecting study in how individuals can get swept up and even propagate these cycles despite their best intentions. His flirtations with different ideological stances embody the relatable struggle of trying to be a good person while still finding your place in an imperfect, unjust system. In this way, The Saint of Bright Doors is both a captivating literary experience and a clarion call to confront the generational trauma and cultural amnesia that modern society often prefers to overlook or revise into neater narratives. Vajra forces the reader to sit with profound discomfort to acknowledge the lives and stories rendered invisible by history's dubious victors. It's a work that will likely be seen as a landmark example of speculative fiction's unmatched ability to estrange the familiar until we can no longer ignore its uncomfortable truths about our world. The Saint of Bright Doors is a master storyteller announcing themselves as a major voice for this decade and beyond. Don't miss this sublimely disorienting gem.